Let's start by sharpening the rip saw because it's the easier of the two. Now that's not to imply that sharpening a crosscut saw is difficult. It's just that with the crosscut saw, we have to worry about two angles, the rake angle and the fleam angle. Whereas with the rip saw, we only have to worry about one angle, the rake angle. The typical rake angle for rip saws is between zero and 10 degrees of rake. Now, if you recall from our earlier discussions, zero degrees of rake is defined as a tooth, front of the tooth, that is perfectly perpendicular to the tooth line of the saw. Rake increases as the front of that tooth begins to lean towards the handle of the saw. A saw with zero degrees of rake makes for a very aggressive and fast cutting saw. However, such aggressive saws are really only going to be useful in relatively soft woods like pine. As the woods get harder, saws that are more aggressive tend to be a little bit more difficult to use. If you use a combination of soft woods and hard woods in your work, therefore, I would suggest relaxing that rake just a little bit. If all you use are very hard woods, such as the oaks and the maples, you may even want to increase that rake angle even more to about 10 degrees or more. For my own work, I use softwoods and hardwoods interchangeably. Most of the hardwoods that I use are relatively well-behaved North American domestic hardwoods like walnut, cherry, occasionally I'll throw some mahogany or oak or maple in there. So I've settled on five degrees of rake for all of my rip saws. To help me hold my file at the correct angle, I use a simple uh, saw filing guide. You can make a simple one out of wood like this by drilling a hole in a block of wood and then scribing a line at your desired rake angle tangent to that hole. Uh, if you have a big file, you can chisel that hole to a triangle shape for smaller holes, you can just, uh, or smaller files rather, you can just insert the file right into the hole. And you want to align the flat face of the file with that rake angle that you drew onto that block. Now, I always file my saws with the handle to my right. So what that means is that I always know that I'm going to line up my file face with a rake angle that is five degrees from the vertical leaning towards the handle. If you like to file your saws with the handle on the left, you're going to have to set up your rake angle guide so that your rake angle and therefore the face of your file leans towards the handle in the opposite direction or five degrees to your left. I always recommend that you file consistently with the handle on the same side of the saw all the time. That's going to help you avoid confusion as to which way the rake angle on your filing guide should be leaning. To get started, I'm going to put the saw in the vise with the teeth high above the vise so that I can joint the tooth line. And to joint the tooth line, I'm gonna run on my mill file from the heel to the toe in a nice smooth stroke. Now the purpose of jointing is to get all of the tips of these teeth in a nice straight line from heel to toe and make sure that you don't have any teeth sticking up higher than the others or much lower than the others. Now most hand saws like this have a tooth line that is breasted. Now what that means is that the tooth line is not dead straight, rather it has a gentle curve from the heel to the toe, a gentle convex curve. What this does is it makes the saw smoother in the cut. And you can check your saw by putting a straight edge. You can see this one is nicely breasted. The straight edge actually balances at the midpoint of the saw, but it's not touching on the ends. And in fact, I can rock it on the tooth line because this saw is nicely breasted and that's intentional. Joinery saws on the other hand are not going to be uh, breasted. Those saws are going to have a tooth line that is perfectly straight. So again, you can check that 
with your straight edge. Now, we wanna try hard to maintain that breasted tooth line when we're jointing. So focus on keeping consistent pressure downward on the teeth as you file from heel to toe. Let the file ride the curve of the teeth. And you're gonna continue until you have a nice shiny flat spot on the top of every tooth. Now you wanna do your best to hold the file nice and flat while you're doing this. What you could do if you're not comfortable just filing freehand is to use a block of wood and you can hold the file on top of that block of wood and run it down. It'd probably be best to take the handle off to do that. Um, they also make purpose-made saw jointers that you can use or you can cut a table saw kerf into the block of wood so the file actually fits in there. Uh, but after a while, you'll get comfortable enough to be able to just file freehand. And when you have a shiny flat spot on the top of every tooth, you're done jointing. Now, in some cases, you may joint the whole saw and you may end up with a tooth or two like this one here that still don't have a flat spot on them. What this means is that this tooth is just lower than the rest of them. Don't worry about that too much. If you only have one or two teeth like this one that are low and don't have a flat spot on them, let them be for now. There's no point in removing more material from all the rest of the teeth than is necessary just to capture this one low tooth. This tooth will eventually be leveled with the rest in future sharpenings. Now, with some old saws, you may have a tooth line that is concave instead of breasted. So it's lower in the middle than it is at the heel and the toe. If that's the case with your saw, you're going to have to correct that before you move on. That is an issue that is caused by improper sharpening. Essentially, prior people who sharpened that saw didn't joint the teeth before they sharpened, and they sharpened more in the middle than they did at the heel and the toe because the middle teeth tend to wear faster, and that creates the concave profile of the tooth line. That saw is not going to work very well. So what you're going to have to do is joint your saw more at the heel and the toe than you do in the middle. And you're going to have to reestablish that properly breasted tooth line. Best thing to do, start joining at the heel and the toe and use a straight edge to check your progress and continue to joint the heel and the toe until your tooth line is properly breasted once again. Now, once the teeth are jointed, we're ready to start sharpening the saw. Using our magic marker can be a helpful aid in judging your progress as you go, because you're going to end up with a lot of shiny metal. So if you color those flat spots on the tips of your teeth that you just jointed in, it's going to help you to distinguish the flats from the shiny metal on the front and back edge of the tooth as you progress through your sharpening. Now, we're going to mount the saw very low in the vise. We want the top of these jaws to really be just below the bottoms of the gullets of the teeth. Now we're gonna file these gullets a little bit deeper, so we wanna leave ourselves a little bit of metal below the gullets, between the bottom of the gullets and the top of the jaw, but not much. The lower you can get it in the saw vise, the less vibration you're gonna have. Now, I also like to sit when I file. So I have my vise mounted low on my bench so that it's at a comfortable height when I'm seated. If you like to stand when you file, you may want to arrange a setup so that your vise is mounted a bit higher, higher so that when you're standing, you don't have to bend way over. Rather, the saw vise is up here and you can more comfortably file while standing. Now, with my rake angle, 
set by my file holder, all I have to do is keep the file holder level and that will assure that I'm filing with a consistent rake angle as I work my way up the saw. And because I don't have any fleam angle, I'm going to file straight across the saw with no angle. Now I like to start at the heel of the saw and I'm going to make several gentle file strokes in each gullet working my way from the heel towards the toe. And I don't want to put a lot of downward pressure on the file because while the file is harder than the saw, if I put too much pressure down, I could break off the teeth on the corner of the file, dulling the file prematurely. So I just want to use general pressure, general pressure on the file, and let the file cut, let the file do its job. Don't force it down into the teeth. Now as I work my way up the saw, I'm filing each tooth, and I'm watching the flats on the tops of each tooth, and I'm trying to file half of the flat off of one tooth, half of the flat off the previous tooth. When I move to the next gullet, I file half of the flat off that tooth and the remainder of the, of the flat off the tooth before it until it comes to a sharp point. When I get to the end, then I'll move the saw in the vise and I'll continue working on the remainder of the teeth. So you can see here what I'm trying to watch as I'm filing. So I've filed the backside of this tooth here. If I start, if I put my file in this gullet and I st start to file, you'll notice I get a little shiny spot on the top of that tooth and I'm starting to file the front of this tooth. I have to watch that flat up there. You can still see the black spot and that's the, the ink from the marker sitting on top of that flat of that tooth. So I want to file this tooth until that flat goes away. Now I'm trying to watch adjacent teeth as well. I don't want to completely file the flat away on this tooth here because when I move to this next gullet, I'm going to be filing the front side of this tooth. So the goal is to try and file half of the flat from each side of the tooth. Now sometimes that may not be possible. In an older saw like this, where the teeth were not really shaped well and filed well the last time, I'm having to do a little bit of repair work. So I may jump back and forth between the gullets. Now you can see I've gotten that tooth to a sharp point. The black is gone. I'll move to the next tooth. And you'll see I'm filing the back of this tooth, but the front of this tooth hasn't really been touched yet because the geometry was kind of bad. Now as I continue to work my way down into that gullet, things are improving. Now I'm filing the front of that tooth. And now the flat on that tooth is gone. Ideally, you want to take half a flat from each tooth. Now, in some cases, such as what you might see here, let me try to start filing that one so you can see what we've got. As I start to file this one, you can see the flat on this tooth is rather large. The flat on this tooth is rather small. That tells me that I need to take more metal off of this tooth than I do off of this tooth. So what I want to do is try and focus my filing with a little bit of sideways pressure. So I'm putting a little sideways pressure here because this flat is bigger than this flat and this flat is bigger than this flat. So I kind of want to 
work on this tooth a little more and this tooth a little more and this one a little bit less so that I can keep them at the same level. So I can put a little bit of sideways pressure here and I can come back and put a little pressure this way to file the back of that tooth. And you will notice I did switch filing guides here um, and that's just because this file did not fit that wooden guide really well. So now, as I start to work the remainder of this gullet, I'm starting to remove more flat here, and this flat is almost, almost gone. And now it's gone. Now I can move on to this gullet here. And we're just going to progress this way, all the way up the saw, watching these little marker flats and filing until they're gone. Now, I can't stress enough how important it is to make sure you file until the flats are completely gone from the tips of the teeth. The most common mistake that I see in my saw sharpening classes is that students are afraid of going too far, so they don't go far enough, and they leave tiny little flats on top of each of the teeth. That saw is not going to be truly sharp, and it is not going to perform very well in that condition. So don't be afraid of going too far. Make sure you go far enough and get the flats on each of those teeth completely filed off until the tooth comes to a very sharp point. So now once I filed all the teeth and I'm certain that all the flats are gone, the teeth are ready to be set. And that's the next step that we would move on to. But test cut the saw first, because sometimes it may not need any additional set. If the saw was overset to begin with, it will probably cut just fine. In fact, it may cut better than it did before it was sharpened because the kerf will be a little bit narrower and tighter and offer you a little bit more control. The saw won't be so sloppy in the kerf. So test it first. If the saw tends to bind in the cut or if it vibrates excessively on the backstroke despite your best efforts to use proper sawing form, then it's likely that you need to add some set to the saw. My particular model of saw set has two adjustments. The first one, the wheel on the front here, has numbers graduated on it that correspond to the number of points per inch in the saw. And there's a little arrow at the top here. So you line up the number of points per inch with that arrow, and that positions this anvil on the inside here at the proper height. If I loosen this screw here, you can see that as I turn the adjustment, the anvil moves. And that puts the bend at the proper height for the size tooth. The second adjustment is down here on the bottom. This wheel moves this little plunger in and out, and that adjusts the amount of set on the saw. So how much the saw bends. So when this is placed over the saw, this plunger will either push the set out so it'll angle it more that way. If I extend the plunger, it'll tend to angle the set this way. That's going to add more set. If I pull this plunger in, it's going to allow the set to sit down more on the saw. That's going to pull the anvil in and in turn it's going to provide or put in less set on the saw. Now I tend to err on the side of putting in too little set rather than putting in too much set. If you've put in too little, it's very easy to go back and add in more set if the saw needs it. But if you overset the saw, it's very difficult to remove set effectively other than filing the sides of the teeth, which makes them thinner and more fragile. So I would suggest putting in less set than you think you need at first 
and if the saw tends to bind or it needs more set, it's very easy to go back and add more. So starting at the heel of the saw, I work my way forward and I set every other tooth as I work my way up because the set is pushing the tooth away from me. And I want to pay attention to the original direction that the saw teeth were set in because I want to do my best to set them in the same direction. Because if I set them in the opposite direction that they were originally set, there's a chance that I could break those teeth off. So you can see from above here how every other tooth is bent in an alternating direction. So I'm going to work my way up the saw, setting every other tooth, bending it in the same direction that it is already bent. Now when I reach the toe of the saw, I'm going to turn the saw around in the vise, start again at the heel, and set the opposite teeth. Once I've set the other teeth all the way up to the toe of the saw, I'm done with the setting process. However, there's one more thing that I do to this saw before I test it out. And it's a process called side jointing. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my mill file and I'm gonna run it up the sides of the teeth. In this case, I'm gonna do it twice on this saw. In most saws, I would only do it once before I test cut the saw, but this saw has a lot of extra set. It's, it's kind of overset, especially towards the back here. Now when I do this, I'm just using the weight of the file. I'm not putting any downward pressure on it. And the purpose of side jointing is to even the set on the sides of the teeth in case any one tooth was overset and it would stick out more than the others. So side jointing makes the set nice and even. So at this point, we've pretty much finished sharpening the rip saw. All that's left to do now is test it out.